Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today I wanted to talk about cognitive biases in the GAMSA. So cognitive biases are essentially these shortcomings in thinking that all of us have. Unfortunately, if we fall for cognitive biases, these usually result in error. Now, we know that the GAMSA is ultimately selecting for future doctors, and I think why ACER includes so many cognitive biases in the GAMSA is because they're so important in medicine. Now, whilst there's no exact figure, it's widely accepted that medical errors are actually one of the leading causes of preventable injury and death. And in this study that I found, it actually estimates that 36% of these errors which have led to injury and death have actually been a result of cognitive bias. So when you put it in this context, it's very clear why ASA really cares a lot about your ability to pick up cognitive biases. Now, it's very hard to actually recognize that you're falling for a cognitive bias if you don't know what it is. So it's widely accepted that just being aware of cognitive bias actually makes you less likely to fall for these traps. So I'm gonna go through some of the top cognitive biases that I've seen in GAMSAT questions and give you some strategies for how you can identify them and ultimately not fall for them. If you're new here, my name's James. I'm a second year medical student and GAMSAT tutor. And I made this channel really to share all the skills, knowledge, and approaches that you need to do well in the GAMSAT. So if that sounds interesting to you, please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future videos. Okay, so the first cognitive bias that I wanted to go through is confirmation bias. Now what this is, is essentially where you look for information that validates a belief. So to give you an example of how this might develop, let's say you're looking at this pathway and you're not really sure what's going on. So you try to understand it and you come to the conclusion that all these arrows are the conversion of something to something else. So if we look down here for glucose, this is glucose being converted to pyruvate and you figure it out and that's great. And you've built this knowledge. But the problem is that is now a belief. So everything that we even learn beneficially can become a belief that holds us back in the future. And to demonstrate that, I'll just like to show you another diagram. So let's say in this question, it's saying, what is converted into calcium binding proteins? Well, if you hold that same belief, then you're gonna say, well, it's calcium because there's an arrow from calcium to the calcium binding protein. But if you actually look a bit more closely in this diagram, the arrows are more the movement of a molecule and this calcium is simply binding with the calcium binding protein. Now I've modeled that example from several ACE of practice questions that I've seen. So I'm not making this up. That is actually something that they test. And you'd be surprised how many people I actually see fall for traps like that. And it's of no mistake of their own really, because what they have is they've learned some kind of pathway, learned what the arrows meant, but they haven't been able to recognize that they're rushing in and just validating their previously held beliefs that an arrow is a conversion pathway. So it is in some instances, but not in all instances. So as for overcoming confirmation bias, a technique I really like is called the pre-mortem. So there's a technique called a cognitive autopsy, which is done after a mistake is made to see every step of the process that went wrong that led to that error. Now, what a pre-mortem is, is doing that same process, but before the mistake has been made. So how we do a pre-mortem is quite simple. All we need to do is just imagine that the answer we've selected is wrong and then find evidence that supports our answer being wrong. And if you think about it, this makes a lot of sense because confirmation bias is where we find information that validates a belief. So what we're essentially doing here is the opposite. We're finding information that invalidates our belief. And the process of actually looking for information that doesn't support the answer that we've rushed into is a really effective way to overcome confirmation bias. So if we go back to our pathway example, if you're looking for evidence that suggests that these arrows are not a conversion, it suddenly becomes a lot easier to notice that they're actually movement arrows. So maybe you see, okay, well, this calcium is here, but it's also here. It tells me that this is calcium. So this can't be a conversion arrow because it hasn't changed. It's the exact same thing. So this must mean something else. And then hopefully you'll come to the conclusion that it's actually the movement of calcium in this pathway. Okay, so secondly is anchoring bias. 
Now, what this is, is when you've actually decided on something and you just can't accept any other information that refutes your idea. It's kind of like you've anchored down on one thing and you're not moving anywhere like a ship. We've all experienced this and I'm sure you've really thought that you're right about something, but then you start ignoring all the evidence and it turns out you're wrong. That's what anchoring bias is. And it's really hard to break out of because you're so certain in your belief. So one technique that I use to avoid anchoring bias is actually to rule answers out rather than rule them in. I find that you can't get as anchored as easily if you're trying to rule things out. You usually anchor to things when you're trying to rule them in because you're finding things that support that belief. So there's a lot of overlap between these biases, but that's one technique is actually ruling them out. And another technique that I like to do is actually what evidence is supporting it other than the first thing that I saw. So what, so firstly, you need to recognize what's the first thing that I saw that made me pick this answer. And if I exclude that, what else is there that actively supports it? So again, we're going to come back to this diagram and maybe we say, okay, the reason why I think calcium is converted to the calcium binding proteins is that arrow. And that's the first thing that we notice. So if we exclude that arrow, what else is actually supporting that notion that calcium is converted to calcium binding protein? Well, the first bit of evidence I would look at is probably the names of the molecule. Does it seem like that molecule has been converted? And I think when you start looking at it that way, you start saying, hang on a minute, I'm looking at calcium and calcium binding protein. How would calcium be converted to the protein that binds calcium? That doesn't really make sense. So if we look past the first thing that jumps to mind, you can sometimes realize that you've been anchoring on that first piece of information, but you might've been actually not focusing on the right thing. If you're liking this video, please like it. It really helps me grow the channel. And if you found any of these cognitive biases quite interesting or things that you've actually seen in your own GAMSAT prep, please let me know in the comments. Okay, and our last bias I'm gonna talk about today is availability bias. Now, what this is, is really with statistics and data, and it's where you latch on to the most easily accessible piece of data or statistic. So I say this all the time in the GAMS app. There's a graph with some axis that's just slightly different, and what you need to do is recognize that it's different in the graph to what the question's asking, and then handle it accordingly. And if you fall for availability bias, you will just go straight for that easily accessible piece of information and just run with that through the question. Okay, so to demonstrate availability bias, we're gonna use this graph. So finally, we're not using that pathway anymore, but this is an example of how the graph might be slightly misleading in the context of the question. So this is a graph showing the average hours of sleep per day, but maybe the question is asking something like, how much time do people spend awake? So what you need to actually recognize is that this is the amount of time that they're spending sleeping. So the time they're awake would be 24 hours, the total amount of time in a day, minus the time that they're sleeping. Now it may seem like an obvious thing, and it is in this context, but I promise you Acer is really good at integrating these traps into their questions and getting you to just fall for availability bias and just pick the number on the graph. So a way that I really like to identify availability bias is simply asking myself, was that too easy? GAMSAT questions should rarely feel easy. And if you rush to an answer in two or three seconds, you've probably fallen for availability bias. And I find that even just by simply asking yourself this question, it forces you to look more deeply into the question and see, is there a mismatch in the units? Is there a trap I'm not looking for? And basically just ask yourself, have I just gone for the easiest, most accessible piece of information? Another way they might trap you with a question like this is asking you to convert these units. So these are hours of sleep in a day, but they might ask you something like, how many seconds of sleep in a month or a year? And you need to be able to recognize that this is different to the units in the question, and then go through a series of mathematical processes to convert it to the right units. So this is the kind of question why uh, I think that unit conversion is such an important skill. So if you don't feel comfortable doing that, I'll link a video here, which you can watch going through everything you need on unit conversion. But otherwise, that's the end of my cognitive biases. So I hope that was useful and I'll see you in the next video.